Excellent. What's up, guys? Welcome back to Probing Paul. This is episode number nine, and this is my monthly Q&A video where I answer questions asked by all of you guys. I usually do this towards the end of the month, but this month I'm more towards the middle of the month. I don't know. Uh, last month I actually did this from the Philippines, so that was a little bit different than uh, when I usually do it, but uh, that's where I was on the map right there. And then, of course, in months past, I have started by showing you this screen, going all the way back down the line to the original screen where we talked about the original name for Probing Paul and where it all came about, and it was a great mystery, but now it's been solved. Anyway, let's uh, dive right into the questions. All of these were taken from last month's episode, so they were all asked in the comments section on YouTube, uh, and thanks to all you guys who posted these. We'll start off with a question from James Wood. Uh, hey Paul, love the vids. I just bought a i7 5820K because I heard the overclockability of it is much better than the 6800K, and I got it for $350 new, but it worries me that I might be missing out on nice features that the 6800K has. Did I make a mistake? That's a good question, and especially when it uh, goes from one generation to the next on something like an Intel enthusiast platform, there's often very similar specs from CPU to CPU. So um, I think you are okay because you got your 5820K for $350, and that's a very good price for 5820K. Um, however, I will say that if the prices were more comparable, uh, like right now it's something like $75 to $100 difference from a 5820K to a 6800K. Um, if it's more like a $30, $40 difference, then I would say just go for the 6800K. What you're gonna get by going with the newer CPU, the 6800K, which is Broadwell E instead of Haswell E, mainly is 128 gig memory support. The 5820K only supports 64 gigs, 6800K supports up to 128. Other than that, uh, instructions per clock level, the 6800K is a little bit faster. It also ships with a slightly higher clock speed. I think it's 3.8 gigahertz versus 3.6 gigahertz. However, if you're overclocking the 5820K, a lot of the reports, and it's tough to say, broadly, generally speaking, but from what I've gathered online by reading a few uh, aggregate websites that take lots of results from lots of different people, 5820K does seem to overclock maybe just a little bit more, but it might be because it's been out longer, which is the 6800K, which just fewer people have, or fewer people have pushed more aggressively. All that said, if you can overclock your 5820K better, or, or to a higher frequency than 6800K, it might outperform it. Uh, with some things, so I think you're fine as is, but if you guys are looking at this and thinking, like, what should I buy right now? Again, I'd say 30 to 40 bucks. If the if it's that much more expensive, just go ahead and get the 6800K. If you're looking at 70, 80, 100 dollars difference, then uh, 5820K will still do just fine for you. And a good question, so thank you for asking. Next question is from Vishnu Prasad. Uh, what do you think about those graphics card boxes used to convert laptops into gaming machines? Are they viable? And I believe what you're talking about is something like this right here, which is a Razer Core. Um, they are certainly viable, and especially viable if you're a particular type of person. I would say that particular type of person would be someone who likes to have just one computer. Because I will say there's definitely some niceness about only having a single computer, which is often a laptop that you can take with you wherever you go. So you're always just working on the same machine and you have sort of the, the sameness from whether you're on the go or whether you're at home. The Razer Core, in my opinion, is very expensive. It's $500 just for the enclosure by itself, not including the graphics card you put in there. 500 bucks is pretty much the cost of a low-end laptop or like a low low to mid-range gaming machine. Uh, so it's really the investment there that, that holds me back from saying, yes, go for it. Uh, apart from the cost, uh, it is very nice to just have your laptop, take it, plug it in, suddenly you have much better uh, graphics support, and you can even have that Razer Core or whatever other external device, that's not the only one that's out there, um, connected up to you know a monitor or something so you don't have to worry about plugging in cables and, and that. So it is convenient, uh, it is nice, and it does benefit some people who really like to have that single machine experience. For me, I probably wouldn't go for it because I like having other systems for gaming that I use at home. Um, but all in all, yeah, it depends on your preference, but I would say they they're, they're seem very pricey right now, which which is sad, but anyway. Uh, next question from Ah Bob. Uh, I'm building my first PC and I think I know everything. My question is, how much anti-static prep do I need to build? Uh, do I need to build it? If I get a mod mat and a wrist strap, it's another 50 bucks. Uh, is that required? And uh, thank you for thanking me, Bob, and I'm glad that I've Provided some inspiration for you. All right, your first mistake here is thinking that you know everything about computers. I certainly do not, and neither does anyone else. Maybe there's, maybe Wendell. Wendell might know everything. But back to your actual question. Uh, I would say no, don't bother in investing in a mod mat and a wrist strap right now. I rarely use anti-static techniques when I'm doing stuff like picking up a motherboard and handling it and stuff like that. 
That said, uh, I would recommend doing more anti-static prevention. Uh, if you live somewhere that's very dry and very dusty uh, or that's very windy, you know, if you live in, I don't know, Arizona or some places in California, if you live in the desert and you find that you constantly get static shocks from like a doorknob or something like that, then maybe consider doing something a little bit more, um, I mean, and you don't need the mod mat. I mean, get a, get a wrist strap. Those are very inexpensive, usually five bucks, maybe 10 bucks. Uh, and they're, they're pretty easy to come by. So that's probably the best preventative measure you, you need. Uh, beyond that, if you don't want to invest anything, just get your case, have your case out somewhere uh, and touch the case. And that will equalize the static buildup, uh, the static electricity buildup between you and the case. It will not necessarily ground you, but it'll neutralize it enough to not damage any components that you happen to pick up with an electric discharge. I have never, uh, to my knowledge, uh, damaged or, or caused a, a piece of computer hardware to not work anymore by a static discharge or static shock. So uh, yeah, that's that's why I can, I'm concerned about it less. That doesn't mean you should ignore it, be aware of it, but it's usually not a huge deal. All right. Uh, since my last episode was from the Philippines, I have a couple questions that were specifically about the Philippines to answer really quickly. Uh, these are kind of connected. Jason Ui and Adrian Kabadu, Kabadu, sorry if I'm mispronouncing your last names. Uh, Jason asks, why are you in the Philippines? Do you have relatives there? Yes, uh, my wife's family lives in the Philippines. We were there for her uh, grandmother's, her Lola's uh, birthday, and she turned 97 years old. Yeah. That's impressive. Uh, Adrian asks, is your wife Filipina? And and I think I just answered that. Yes. Yes, she is. Uh, a couple more here. Uh, Gabriel Pasquale asks, do you have any comments on the slow internet of our country? Uh, Stuart says, hi. Thank you. Hi, Stuart. Uh, GBDX was commenting that I am on an island. And he yeah, Gabriel just wants to know uh, what I consider fast and if the internet speeds were fast there. We had internet set up at my wife's family's house specifically for us to be there because my wife works... Uh, on the internet just like I do and so we needed to have connection. We had about five megs down and about one meg up which was perfectly adequate for us. So it wasn't bad. It wasn't bad at all. Next question from Mark Himmler. I already have an MSI GTX 1060 Gaming X with six gigs of RAM. Is there a need for me to upgrade to a 1070? Games are having higher video demands. I'm afraid my 1060 won't be able to handle it in a year or so. Also, is an RX 480 crossfire than, better than a single 1070? Uh, all right, so that, that second question first. Yes, an RX 480 crossfire is better than a single 1070 in situations where you can take advantage of crossfire, and that's not universal across the board. So I typically would recommend a faster single card rather than a crossfire configuration out of the gate. But let me let me answer your question more in general here, because basically what you're saying is I have this graphics card right now. I'm worried about in the future it not being able to keep up with games. I would say live in the now for right now. Um, what are you using to game on your monitor uh, in particular? If you're gaming at 1080, your 1066 gig is totally fine for that. And uh, whatever games you're playing right now, run some sort of monitoring utility, uh, whether it's Fraps or something like MSI Afterburner or EVGA Precision X or something like that, and just keep an eye on your frame rates. If you have a 60 hertz 1080 monitor and your graphics card is able to push 60 to 100 uh, frames per second in most games that you play with, you know, even if you have to turn some settings just slightly down or that kind of thing and you're happy with it, then be happy with it for now and wait until next year when you actually get the next game and you actually start to see like, oh crap, I'm only doing 40 frames per sec now, per, per second, 40 FPS now in this new game and I wasn't getting something like that before and then consider upgrading because those new games that you're worried about aren't out yet, and the new graphics cards and other new computer hardware that's going to be out at that time as well is not out yet. And you'll probably be able to get a better deal on those or a better deal on the stuff that's out right now at that time in the future. Because if you wait, things are always going to get less expensive and new hardware is always going to come out and you'll have more and better options in the future. Thank you for your question, Mark. Devin Johnson asks, if you had to choose wh whose PC would you smash with a hammer? Kyle's hotline or my... Arctic Panther. This is a this is a very tough question, Devin. Uh, I'll 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 do a follow up question that's been asked to me, but I don't have uh, a, an actual screenshot of here, which is where is Arctic Panther? Because that's not Arctic Panther in the background any, anymore. Arctic Panther is in the computer room uh, along with Hotbox, my wife's computer, and I do have a project coming up uh, probably next week. I'm going to be like kind of redoing that room and reconfiguring the desks and and maybe even making it so I can live stream from in there. That would be kind of cool. Um, 
So yeah, you'll be seeing it some more, but I moved it in there because I actually use it for editing a lot more now um, than when it was out here and I was mainly just using it for gaming. Uh, back to your main question though, whose PC would I smash with the hammer if I had to choose? Um, I'd probably take a really like pragmatic approach to it. And all right, so it'd be, it would be subjective to, is does smash mean completely destroy everything or does smash mean like get a couple good shots of video of like hitting it with the hammer and then like, okay, it's all, all good. Because for me, it comes down to like investment of time and the value and performance of the hardware that's inside. So for me, investment of time is that power supply. I have never spent more time on a single piece of computer hardware than I did sleeving that power supply. So I don't want that to go anywhere. So if I have to destroy everything, I'd probably say I'll smash Kyle's hotline PC because... I wouldn't have to kill my power supply, which I just want to keep forever simply because I invested so much time in it. However, if I can just like beat it up a little bit and then like maybe salvage some parts and maybe save the power supply, then I'd say Arctic Panther simply because it's got two 980s in it, whereas uh, the hotline has two 980 Ti's and it's just a more powerful system. And yeah, anyway, so <laughs> there's, there's my pragmatic answer for you for that one. Quick one, quick one from Dan Sindoni. What are your thoughts on quantum computing and how do you think it will affect the gaming and hardware enthusiasts out there? Uh, Dan, I am still trying to wrap my mind around quantum computing. I have a vague concept of how it works and probabilities and superpositions and all that kind of stuff. Uh, I think the potential for it is incredible. It's like the next step for humankind type thing. Uh, there's also a lot of questions about it uh, as far as appropriateness when it, we take it and do machine learning with it and that kind of thing. You know, the singularity and computers becoming self-aware. I mean, all this science fiction sort of stuff starts to pop out of the woodwork. Um, I don't think it will affect gaming and hardware enthusiasts for some time. Um, I mean, I would say five to ten years, but that's just a, a number I'm pretty much pulling out of my backside. I'd like to understand it better because um, it's definitely messes with your mind just trying to figure it out. But um, yeah, I mean, it's definitely something to keep an eye on, but I don't think we're going to see any quantum computers available from Intel in the next five years or anything like that. Alexander Radetsky says, what's the best processor you can throw on a mini ITX board, ideally with a maximum number of cores? Well, the answer is the motherboard, which is the ASRock Mini ITX X99 board, which is uh, right here, X99E-ITX-AC. ASRock is the only motherboard manufacturer that has gone so far as to put an X99 uh, chipset and an LGA2011-V3 socket on a Mini ITX board. Uh, it does come with its limitations, though, uh, such as only two uh, DIMM slots for DDR4 memory. Uh, it comes with this sort of custom, unique, whatever designed proprietary uh, cooler uh, in, er in order to actually fit something this big in a mini ITX form factor. And I mean, it's it's got its limitations. So the answer is a 6950X. I don't know if this has Xeon support. There might be a really high core count Xeon you could drop into this or something like that. But if you're looking at the consumer side, 6950X, uh, 10 core to 20 thread beast of a processor. But I really feel like you would be um, hamstringing it by dropping it into this board because not only are you limited to two DIMM slots so you can't take advantage of like the 128 gigs of, of memory support or anything like that but you've only got a single PCIe Express PCI Express expansion slot so your 40 PCIe lanes on that processor are largely going to go unused because the most you're going to use out of that is like 16 uh, by 16 of your PCIe lanes and then you know you've got some other stuff connected in there that's going to use up a bit more but you can't expand and add more and take advantage of it so 6950X is the answer. Uh, I don't think that's practical. The best practical, in my opinion, CPU to drop into a mini ITX PC is the one that I did in my video, uh, my monthly builds video for this month, where I tried to build the, the fastest mini ITX gaming PC possible, which would be a 6700K for right now, four core, eight thread. Or when KB Lake comes out, uh, it's supposed to be beginning of next year, uh, then probably 7700K, assuming that they continue the same naming scheme for their processors. Okay, that's all for this video, guys. I hope you've enjoyed it. I hope uh, Hero's snoring in the background hasn't distracted you all very much. I'll be back very soon with more videos. Hit the thumbs up button if you enjoyed this. And of course, leave me comments in the comments section for next month's Grobing Paul. Thanks again for watching, and we'll see you next time.